Welcome to Washington in Focus, your source for this week's top stories in the state of Washington. I'm Brett Davis, Washington State Editor for the Center Square Newswire Service. This week, we will be discussing the Washington State Attorney General's Office being tasked with investigating a $42 million tort claim filed against it, the interim Seattle police chief calling for change in the department's hiring process as staffing woes continue, Spokane pushing for a public safety tax increase after eyeing a $9 million cut to the police department, and the Protect Energy Choice Initiative being officially certified by the Secretary of State's office for this November's ballot. That's ahead on Washington In Focus. I'm Brett Davis. They're simple, boring, never thought of until they're needed. They're windshield wipers. Only when Mary Anderson became annoyed that New York trolley drivers were stopping to wipe their windshield by hand did anybody do something about it. By attaching a spring-loaded arm to a rubber blade, one woman made travel easier and safer. Look to innovate and pass it on from PassItOn.com. Welcome back to Washington In Focus. I'm Brett Davis. Now let's jump into the headlines. What started with an intent to build a state-managed database in the wake of the George Floyd killing has become a drawn-out feud between the state and a man who designed the software that could manage the data. What was originally a dispute about who can bid on a process has turned into a legal battle. The man who designed the software recently filed a $42 million tort claim against the state attorney general's office and its client, Washington State University. The case has been handed over to the AGO's tort claim division to investigate. T.J. Martinell, the Center Square's investigative reporter, has followed the case from the beginning. Uh, This seems like a case of the uh, fox guarding the hen house. Uh, Can you give us some background details and how we got here? Yeah, so the state legislature passed a bill in 2021 regarding a police use of force database. And the idea is that this would be a database where people from the public could view statistics on police use of force incidents, such as when they occurred, how many people were involved, where it occurred. And they had a request for proposal process set up through the attorney general's office for a institution of higher learning within Washington state to set up the database. Bob Scales, who's the president of police strategies, which develops its own police uh, databases for law enforcement agencies throughout the country. They were, he was considering, uh, subcontracting with one of the universities chose, he chose not to, but what he ended up doing throughout the process was noting what he considered to be acts of colluding between the attorney general's office and Washington state university, which is a client of the AGO in order to ensure that it would get the contract. Then what's followed is a many ethical complaints and many of them have been either investigated directly or indirectly by the attorney general's office. And so more recently, he's accused Washington State University and the attorney general's office of using copyrighted and proprietary information from his company to set up this database. Then after that, he's filed a tort claim of $42 million with the state's Department of Enterprise Services Office of Risk Management, claiming that he suffered damages as a result of these uh this, these act, illegal activities, including he's accused them of racketeering. Uh, now I understand the Washington State University. They said there, there's going to be there's been no decision so far in a formal investigation. Is that correct? Yeah. So he filed a ethical complaint against two Wazoo employees within the university, and the Washington State University president sent him a letter saying that no investigation was going to take place, despite the fact that the president has no formal role in ethics complaints investigations. Uh, shortly after that letter was sent out, the provost who does handle ethical complaints emailed Bob Scales saying that she was out of the office and would be looking into it. However, as you mentioned, there's been no decision about whether to launch a formal investigation. Is there any sort of timeline on when that decision will be made? No, I don't believe that there's anything under. I, from last I checked, there's been no word about whether that's going to proceed forward. But that's one of several ethical complaints that have been filed by Bob Scales against either the Attorney General's office or Washington State University. Now, I know you've been doing some follow-up on this, and you found out that under state law, the the state risk manager is not required to assign the tort claim to the Attorney General's office. So so what does that mean? What have you found out since? Right. So shortly after Bob Scales filed his tort claim with the DES's Office of Risk Management, the Office of Risk Management sent him a letter saying that they had assigned the tort claim investigation to the Attorney General's office. Uh, they're a tort claim division. So I reached out to DES to say, why did you assign this to 
the attorney general's office when you didn't have to, but also when they're one of the defendants in this tort claim. And they argued that it was due to the fact that the attorney general's office represents them legally and is handling uh, the litigation for it. The problem is that they're not at the litigation phase yet. Uh, the tort claim is just the initial step. And while most tort claims do lead to litigation, this is, we haven't reached that point yet. Right. Where litigation is occurring. So their response is interesting. They also did not respond to, to requests for comment about whether or not this constituted a conflict of interest to have the attorney general's office investigate a accusation involving its own office. Well, that sounds like, this sounds like an ongoing story. I'd be curious to see how this plays out. And I know you'll stay right on top of it. Definitely. All right. Thank you so much, TJ. Seattle's interim police chief, Sue Ra, recently cited concerns about staffing during a presentation to the Seattle City Council's Public Safety Committee. According to data presented to the council, the police department continues to lose roughly twice as many officers as are being hired. Western Washington reporter Spencer Pauley has been keeping tabs on the Seattle Police Department's staffing woes. What is the current state of the city's staffing shortage? Give us a number, Spencer. Well, Brett, I don't really come bearing great news about the current <laughs> situation with Seattle Police Department. Um, every time the, uh, the department presents the latest updates on the staffing numbers, it seems to be worse and worse. Um, so to give you some statistics, the first six months of this year, uh, Seattle Police Department has managed to hire 21 officers which is 68% less than the 65 officers planned to hire for through that time. Meanwhile, 55 officers have separated during that same time, so we're continuing to see the fleet decrease. Overall, I would say since the beginning of 2020, the total number of fully trained officers within the department has decreased by 360 officers. The department as a whole is at an all-time low for staffing levels. Yikes. To give you a better context, Brett, um, this means available officers are overworked and response times are increasing. I think that's what I'm trying to explain here to the listeners about what what's going to be the issue with this. Um, so an example that uh, Interim Chief Rar uh, presented was that the North Precinct, which has a lot of crime, this is around the Aurora Avenue, uh, Aurora Bridge, where there's a lot of crime going on. So that North Precinct has 10 officers on duty. So if a shooting happens, which is becoming more and more common there, you have to have six to seven officers respond to that. There is also crime happening elsewhere. So that just leaves a huge amount of time for, you know, response for other crimes happening within. We have to prioritize a shooting. There's plenty of other stuff going on there, and there's only 10 officers who can do something about it. So that just gives you kind of the context of the issue we're seeing here within the city. Right, so the department is stretched really thin is what you're saying? Absolutely. So what is the interim chief for our proposing to improve the staffing crisis at the police department? So chief Rar basically said the city needs to change its hiring process in order to have a larger pool of candidates. Now she didn't set an exact way to do this, but by, by changing the hiring process, this helps the department compete with other uh, de- police departments within the region, it's a huge com- competition across. And when you have one officer, one candidate, they're looking elsewhere too. They are going through the process for the Seattle Police Department, the Renton Police Department, et cetera, et cetera. And Seattle Police Department needs to incentivize them to hire these people by shortening the process and making it easier. So while RAR didn't base, essentially have an outline plan, she basically told the Seattle Police Public Safety Committee, we need to work, prioritize this first. Sounds like they want to get rid of some of the red tape. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which costs money, you know? Right. Uh, speaking of costing money, has the city implemented other initiatives to boost police staffing, you know, previous to this? And if so, how much is that costing? Okay. So th- basically the city has push pumped in millions of dollars into its recruitment and t- retention program since at least 2022 when the police shortage really started to uh, fasten up but i will say as recently as may the the um <clears throat> the city council approved a bill to transition three positions from the department of human resources to the police department as a way to kind of speed up this hiring process the issue is is that those positions have yet to be filled, according to Roar, because 
Seattle City Council Chair Sarah Nelson said, we did this already, and this costs $146,000 to the general fund. Has this been uh, enforced? Have we hired people? And the answer is no, not yet. So we're still not getting uh, getting going on this initiative here. No bang for the public's buck? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so did you glean anything else notable from Raj's presentation? I will say I didn't include it in the story just because there was so much uh, included in this presentation from Rar. But one thing that was notable is that she said that the ish- the reason for the staffing shortage, and I haven't heard this before outright from the Seattle Police Department, is a blame on the defund the police movement. I think when this first happened in 2020, we saw the city council back then kind of fold over to the public demand for this. And as a result, we've seen the staffing shortage really increase because of this. Now, Roar said that, but also some of the new city council members, including Rob Saka, called this the defund the police movement shameful and also blamed all of this for that reason. It's kind of an interesting thing to hear from the Seattle Police Department for the first time. But this is interim chief uh, Roar's first presentation to the city council since she was hired as in after Chief Adrian Diaz was fired. A baptism by fire. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, it doesn't sound like things are getting better, but hopefully they can turn it around. Uh, thanks for staying on top of this, Spencer. I'm sure we'll hear more about this in the future. The Spokane City Council recently approved a resolution for a sales and use tax for community safety on this November's ballot. It's a one-tenth of one percent increase in the local sales tax. Eastern Washington reporter Tim Clauser has been keeping an eye on this. Now, this isn't the first tax increase proposed by the mayor of Spokane, is it? Can you give us some context on this latest proposed tax increase and what came before it? Yeah, Brett. So this sales tax uh, increase replaces Brown's uh, community safety property tax levy that she proposed back in April. Uh, now, that levy was going to go on the August ballot and would have generated around $40 million annually. Well, there wasn't enough guardrails on that levy. So uh, due to a wealth of concerns from the council and community members, she ultimately opted to pull it from the ballot and instead come up with a different initiative. Now, she announced this sales tax increase back at the beginning of the month in hopes to plug some of the city's uh, approximately $50 million deficit while mitigating some personnel cuts. Now, the city's deficit has grown to $50 million uh, since 2019. Um and that's due to a uh, lack of long-term planning, um, devoting one-time funding towards reoccurring expenditures, uh, which have just piled up over the years. Now, Spokane is required to have a balanced budget each year, so it makes up for that deficit with its reserves. So while the general fund deficit is currently at around $25 million, the reserves right. are also at $25 million, depleted um, since 2019. I see. So how much is this uh, new tax projected to bring in? Is it going to make a difference? It could make a difference, but the impact of that difference is what's questionable. If approved, this sales tax would bring in about $7.7 million annually, and about 15% of that would go to the county. So um, the city would keep about $6.5 million, give or take a little bit, uh, with about $1.15 million going to the county. And it's notable that the city could have gotten this same amount if it had passed the county's jail construction tax that it put in the ballot last November, uh-huh. the same time Mayor Lisa Brown was elected. However, she wouldn't support it. And in turn, neither would the voters. Uh, voters struck it down. But now here she is um, heading back to the ballot with another tax measure, trying to figure out how to get this money. Right. I understand uh, a lot of the motivation is in part because of possible cuts that be, could be coming otherwise, including, you know, $9 million cut to the police department. Can you expand on that a little? Yeah. So the city's been looking at a few different ways to uh, solve this financial crisis that they're in. Um, I mentioned before that community safety property tax levy uh, that she pulled. Um, and in between um, pulling that and proposing it, she also announced that the city would do a few other measures. Uh, one, which they already did, was move towards a biannual budget rather than a year to year budget. Um, and the second being a two book outlook. Now, uh, the two book outlook relies on two outlooks. The first being a budget moving forward with not devoting any one-time funding towards reoccurring expenditures for the most part. That's not 100%. The second outlook kind of uh, looks at how the budget would fare if Brown's levy had passed. Now, she had a budget meeting last Friday and kind of went through what a 10% uh, citywide cut would look like. And the three biggest cuts uh, to that list were between 
uh, the police department, the fire, uh, and different aspects of the court services. Now, $9.3 million is being proposed to cut from the Spokane Police Department. $4.75 4.75 million from the Spokane Fire Department and more coming from the courts. Now that's split up between municipal court, community court, public defenders and such, but it adds up to be a considerable amount. And this I is imagine that all, got a lot of people's attention. <laughs> yes, it, it's getting quite a bit of people's attention. And this is all while the county is really struggling with the lack of capacity in its jails. And those facilities are used both by the county and the uh, city as well. So um, the county at the same time, is also uh, asking voters to pass a tax measure at the November ballot. But theirs is different from the city's. Theirs is a renewal, not an increase. Voters would keep spending the same amount of money on the same tax that they've already been paying rather than increasing the tax. It's the same amount as Lisa Brown's tax, except it takes sales tax from the county as a whole, and it funds ongoing operations for detention services, like I said, which operates for the county and the city. Now, if the city's sales tax passes and the county's fails, that would ultimately mean around a 90% cut to annual funding for detention services, meaning it would uh, greatly exasperate the issues the county's already experiencing, which would in turn make public safety worse as a whole um, for the city as well. And the county sheriff even told me this, and uh, he reaffirmed his statement this morning in an email to over 250 local community members, business leaders, and state and local officials. Wow. Sounds like a perfect storm here (laughs) in a bad way. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it'll be up to up to voters in November to decide to sort this out, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's up to the voters now. I mean, uh, the county is coming up with a media campaign to really push for uh, its renewal. Um, but really, it's going to come down to what voters want to do in November. And notably, Brown sales tax that she's proposing, it's supposed to help community safety, public safety in Spokane, which has um, been trending downhill as of the last few years. But the state requires uh, Brown and the city to state the intended purposes for that funding in the ballot title. But their ballot title only says community safety purposes, which is very vague. Uh, Also noteworthy that the state requires only one third be used for criminal justice purposes, which is different than community safety purposes, meaning that the city could then take the other two thirds and put it towards other community safety priorities that it's previously addressed, uh, such as traffic calming projects, bike infrastructure, and what it calls community resiliency, which is essentially the term it's dubbed for fighting climate change. So a lot of people are worried that this, in fact, will do nothing in terms of public safety for Spokane and instead uh, will take taxpayer money and ultimately make uh, the state of public safety significantly worse. So unintended consequences. Mm Mm-hmm. Be curious to see. I imagine county and city officials are uh, pulling their hair out trying to see or trying to wait on on how voters will decide these two. Will they pass both of them or neither one of them? One or the other? Who knows? Yeah, that's that's what they're looking at right now. Everyone is extremely worried. I talk to people from the city and the county almost on a daily basis about this. uh, And everyone is very eager to see uh, what the voters decide in November, Brett. All right. Well, thanks for keeping us surprised of this. I look forward to future stories on this ongoing issue. So Initiative 2066 to protect energy choices like natural gas has officially qualified for this November's ballot, according to the Washington Secretary of State's office. Capital correspondent Carlene Johnson has been covering the issue. Backers of the measure had a short window to gather signatures. How are they able to turn in more signatures than any other initiative effort in such a short amount of time? I guess because a lot of uh, people, a lot of businesses don't want to lose the option for natural gas, right? I mean, yeah, they had uh, 50 days. Actually, I think it was 49 days um, to collect signatures because there was a a legal challenge uh, on the uh, title for the initiative. So once that played out in Thurston County, then they launched uh, literally, I think, the next day, sending people out with petitions and and um, had a multitude of these super signing events right over weekends where they uh, both Let's Go Washington and the Building Industry Association of Washington, the two main uh, supporters of Initiative 2066, um, you know, they got people rallied behind this and clearly... Um, 500, was it 546 
thousand signatures were turned in earlier this That's month. Way more than they needed, right? Way more than they needed. Yeah. Yeah. So that was basically, you know, even with people double signing, people signing that aren't registered voters, you know, those get tossed out. So you always try to have, you know, more than enough, but they needed just over 324,000 valid signatures. Um, and that's, you know, based on the number of votes that were cast in the last governor's uh, election. So needed 324, turned in 546, even accounting for the ones that got, you know, tossed out. You know, it, it was a foregone conclusion. They were going to uh, to be on the ballot and get certified by the Secretary of State's office, which is what happened this week. Seems like they were highly motivated. Highly motivated. Yeah. Well, and, you know, just to be honest, I'm one of those people. I've got natural gas stove that's nice to be able to use uh, if the power goes out and it's a cold winter day. Um, you know, my, my water heater, natural gas powered um, and not having the option eventually of, you know, being able to get parts for those or even have natural gas coming to my home, um, you know, is not a very... Welcome concept. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just a personal note. And I think there's a lot of people that felt the same way. And business right. owners, you think of all the restaurants, Brett, that, that use natural gas, um, you know, not being able to use that and somehow having to, you know, electrify all of their appliances. It would put so many of the smaller, uh, you know, restaurants and other businesses that, that use natural gas. It would it would knock them off line for sure. Now, on the other side of the coin, there are detractors who argue that this initiative isn't necessary as there has been no move, they say, away from natural gas. So why do supporters think the measure is so important? Uh, well, specifically because uh, House Bill 1589, which passed this last legislative session, um, it allows Puget Sound Energy, the state's largest utility, to start planning how to move away from natural gas. So remember, it wasn't that long ago that natural gas was the clean fuel, right? I mean, it was just, this was good right. for the environment. Well, now it's apparently not. And um, it's part of Governor Jay Inslee's, you know, climate change agenda to phase out um, natural gas. Now, the folks that say 2066 wasn't necessary say, well, the, you know, there's nothing in 1589 that says we're going to eliminate natural gas. But it, what, what this bill does, and by the way, it was requested by Puget Sound Energy, it insulates them. They're the largest monopoly utility, again, I'll say, from having to pay the price for these state mandated carbon reduction goals set by the governor. So this is about insulating them as they phase out. That's the whole idea. Nobody argues that that's kind of what the motivation was for it. But they say, well, there's nothing specifically in this that says we're going to cut your natural gas off. But clearly... Well, people probably say it looks like it's heading that way. Absolutely. And the Utilities and Transportation Commission, um, which has to sign off on PSE's you know, rate increases, um, keep in mind, they're all appointees of the governor, every single one of them. So certainly you could surmise <laughs> looking at it that PSE, UTC, all on the same page. And um, according to BIAW, the building industry, you know, backers of the, one of the backers of the uh, initiative 2066, they said that the average residential customer, somebody like myself, it would cost nearly $40,000 to, you know, transition uh, from gas to electricity. $40,000 per. You know, most of us don't have 40K just laying around. To well, yeah, I'm spend. over here, over here. Nope. I don't see any. Yep. I, I can't find my missing 40K, but <laughs> at any rate, um, this thing's going to be on the ballot in November and uh, along with three other initiatives that are already. Yeah, I'm just going to say there are three on the ballot already and this is a, this is going to be a fourth. So can you just uh, give us a quick summary of the other three initiatives that are yeah. also on the ballot? Yeah, it's uh, we've got three others that are going to be on the ballot. Um, one is potentially going to, in fact, repeal the CCA, um, the uh, Climate Commitment Act, which drove up gas prices. Uh, over the last year. That's a huge one. Uh, Governor Inslee is pretty concerned about that. Um, the other would protect um, our choice to opt out of the um, 
a walk cares program. So t- the payroll tax that's supposedly going to set aside enough for us to take advantage of that should we need it down the line for long term care. This would not repeal the walk cares program, but it would let make it optional, make it optional. And the third one would repeal the capital gains tax, which, of course, there's lots of concern about that from supporters of, of cap gains because of the billions of dollars that have flooded into uh, state coffers to fund early learning and other education programs. Of course, it didn't bring in as much uh, in its second year of implementation because a lot of rich people have figured out how to not have to pay <laughs> capital gains taxes. So um, those three and now 2066 all to be on the fall ballot. So four initiatives on the ballot. Unusual. I'd be uh, curious to see what voters decide on November. And I know you'll stay on top of the situation. Will do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carly. A big thank you to our journalists for sharing their stories. Stay up to date with these and more at thecentersquared.com. I'm Brett Davis. And until next time, this has been Washington in Focus. 